Kickboxing and Muay Thai took center stage this past weekend with three marquee events. A heavyweight battle in glory, an MMA versus Muay Thai fight in one championship, and a bare knuckle Muay Thai showdown. In the end, the old dudes took all the headlines and web traffic. Welcome to Kick Weekly with Tim Wheaton, the kickboxing podcast. This week we are covering Glory Collision 6, Jonathan Hagerty versus Fabricio Andrade in 1, and Buakau versus Senshai in BKFC. So taking a look at some of the web traffic that we had coming in on some of the websites and seeing the results of what search terms were bringing people into the channel, Buakau versus Senshai was the one who took all of the headlines. And if you go look at the fight stats, even now, the replay of the fight on YouTube already in just three days almost has three million views at this very moment. Those are pretty amazing numbers. Even on this YouTube channel, uh, out of the five top search terms that brought people to the Kafka Sports channel, four out of five of them were Buakau, or some variants of Buakau versus Senjai, Buakau BKFC, or, or, or Buakau Muay Thai, or whatever it might have been. He is the guy who's moving the needle more than anyone else. The other odd one out was, of course, Rico Verhoeven, and we'll get to that in a little bit. So this episode, we're going to be covering three events, but let's start with the one that everybody wants to talk about clearly. He's getting all the clicks. I put his name in the title. I put his face right on the thumbnail, so people are going to click on this one. This one's going to be high traffic because the only thing people Google is Buakau. In kickboxing, it's not even a secret. It's a, it's a massive open idea. The only people who are getting clicks right now is Buakau and Bader Hari. But this week, it's Buakau getting clicks. Um, so he had a bare knuckle Muay Thai match against all time legend, all time great in Muay Thai, Sanshai. Buakau mostly cut his teeth and really put together his impressive titles in the world of kickboxing. Um, and I mean, going in, most people said this fight would just be okay. They're friends, they're a few weight classes apart. Uh, they're also both quite old, and that's more or less exactly what the fight was. It, it did uh, a lot of people apparently on the ground in Thailand, uh, especially people who are Thai, were not happy with this fight at all. There was no Y crew. It looked like a sparring match. Both guys were old. The size difference uh, was was quite pronounced, as you saw in the exchanges and in the fight. The, the strength, everything about it, like Buakau just proved why we needed. Buakau proved why we needed weight classes, um, but in the end, it just didn't matter. BKFC Asia put together a show that put together headlines. In terms of just numbers of who was pulling traffic on Google and putting numbers out on YouTube, this is one of BKFC's biggest shows. And in terms of kickboxing and Muay Thai for the entire year, in terms of just numbers, this is one of Muay Thai's and kickboxing's biggest, uh, biggest uh, uh, fights. Uh, apparently some of the people on the ground I was speaking with were saying that most of the people at the actual live event were were not Thai people. They were mostly all tourists from somewhere in Europe. Uh, and, I'm, you know, I'm not overly surprised by that. That's kind of what I've heard uh, over and over again. So Thai people were not showing up in droves for this kind of fight. Buakau has two more fights currently on the calendar. Uh, and then you'll probably have a few more after that. But Right now, he will be fighting December 2nd in RWS Muay Thai. No opponent is yet announced. It's not clear if this will be a Muay Thai or kickboxing bout, but his opponent and the rules will be revealed on Thursday, November the 9th. So I think when this comes out, it'll be tomorrow. And probably by the time you're listening, he does have an opponent announced. So make sure to check that out December 2nd in RWS Muay Thai. And then Buakau in early 2024 will have a boxing match against Manny Pacquiao. So, I mean, cool. Yeah, he's got a bunch of fights lined up. He's still making money. And the reason that he keeps having these fights lined up is, well, he kind of needs the money. And promoters are willing to pay him. As I said, look at the traffic. On a weekend where we had one championship, Glory and Buakau, Buakau got uh, more ratings, got more searches than anyone else. He pulled more traffic on YouTube and pulled more traffic on Google. That's why they're willing to pay him the big bucks. And if he's willing to do some of these matches for money, He's going to keep turning up. If you keep paying him money, he will keep turning up. <laughs> and the thing is, like, Buakau pulls in numbers for me as well. I've seen search terms in the past. Uh, th this isn't the first time that I've woken up and suddenly thought, oh, no, I need to write about Buakau or need to talk about Buakau on air because he brings in numbers. I've always known that he brings in numbers. That's why people keep hiring him. Um, I just don't have any hard-hitting analysis about him. His career was awesome in K1. Uh, he was... 
electric. He changed the dynamic. And like as the lower weight fighters were taking over all the headlines with people like Masato, Buakao came in and changed the tone of the fights. He raised the stakes of those fights. He he changed the dynamic of the entire tournament. And because of it, he was well celebrated in Thailand. He was treated as a royal. People turned out for his fights through and through. And uh, that was 15 years ago. Of like he's been out of his prime for how long? Like even by, even by 2011, some of those fights. Like was he out of his prime then? Yeah, probably about 12 years ago. Uh, so I'm blaming him. I'm happy to see him get paid. That's great. Super happy to see that. But uh, yeah, just I don't have any crazy analysis. He hasn't changed his game for a long time. He's he's slowing down. Uh, he's gonna beat on people who are less skilled than him. But the thing is, as he is getting booked in these other events, like whether it's BKFC booking him next or. Uh, RWS booking him next or the boxing match in somewhere in Bangkok booking him next. I, of course, I'm going to talk about it. It gets clicks. <laughs> you know, this is this is the thing. Um, you can't suddenly get very choosy about what you're covering. It would be great if I could talk about some Conor McGregor's or some Ronda Rousey's or some Brock Lesnar's to really bring in clicks. Uh, but simply, that's just not, you know, what, what I'm choosing to cover. It's not. But Buakau brings in clicks. Matahari brings in clicks, so I'll talk about them every once in a while. And I know what you're thinking. Why don't you just have an MMA show? Why don't you just have a UFC show? Well, well, I do I do cover the UFC and MMA. The thing is that kickboxing didn't have a show like this that was just about, here's what the current news, here's the current state of kickboxing and Muay Thai that's easily accessible. Because a lot of the podcasts that were existing in the kickboxing space were, number one, they were in Dutch, which is fine. <laughs> I get it. Or number two, they were really for in-the-weeds, hardcore kind of people. Uh, so this is meant to be a little bit of middle ground of, like, if, you, this is, if you're a hardcore in kickboxing and have watched every event, you'll be able to tune in and hopefully learn something. But if you're brand new to kickboxing, you'll be able to tune into the show and learn quite a bit, and it's accessible to you. And if you want some hard-hitting UFC and MMA coverage, uh, UFC 295 is this weekend, and it is featuring former two-division glory kickboxing world champion Alex Pereira against the former Ryzen champion and former UFC light heavyweight champion Yuri Prohoshka. Uh, Alex Pereira, of course, was the former middleweight champion in the UFC as well. Uh, and this is going to be a really fun fight. I'm really looking forward to this one. I'm not going to get too in-depth on it. I think that's as much as I'm willing to cover on this show. There's dozens and dozens, hundreds and hundreds of MMA podcasts out in the world, so make sure to tune into those ones. Let's get into a Glory Collision 6. Calf Kick Sports was there in person. We had some representatives there on the ground, and apparently it was a great show. The atmosphere in the arena was quite good. Uh, I did watch it on the pay-per-view on the Glory Fight channel. Um, I didn't watch it with sound, so I don't know entirely what the audience was feeling or what were what they were thinking. Um, but people in the arena said that it was sounding quite good in there. People were quite excited until the, the main event. But let's talk about the main event. Rigo Verhoeven, the face of kickboxing. The, 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 the center of Glory's organization, the heavyweight king, an all-time great, all that sort of stuff, came in after two and a half years away to defend his crown against the interim champion, and he was able to get a unanimous decision win, and it wasn't an overly interesting fight. Um, I think round one, some of the judges scored it at 10-10, not due to how close it was, but mainly due to how much inactivity there was in round number one. Um, round three, one of the fighters didn't even land a single strike in that round. Uh, the overall punch count after five rounds combined, including leg kicks, punches, everything, all the strikes combined, it was about 90 strikes landed overall. So it wasn't the most amazing fight that I've ever seen, but uh, Rico showed that he was the better fighter. Uh, he showed that he seemed head and shoulders above uh, Cookie to Rico Saro. He wasn't able to put him away. Um, the clinch made it quite uninteresting. It was like Rico would, would throw a couple of punches. So Rico was really trying to paw with the jab lightly to get reactions and get Cookie throwing back. And Cookie, I think, recognized this and wasn't willing to throw a bunch of power back because he saw that he was probably falling into a trap. Uh, and then they had a stalemate based on this for quite a while. And then Rico would throw a little bit of power and then duck into the clinch. And that was quite frustrating for uh, Cookie Tariko Saro, who like ran him in the clinch, almost tackled him at one point. 
um, because he, he didn't know what to do in the clinch. And the thing is, like, if the ref doesn't break you up right away, you should be working in the clinch. But the ref was jumping in right away so that, I don't know, it was OK. It was all right. I wouldn't watch it again. And there really isn't much more to say about this fight. It wasn't it wasn't much more than that. Uh, it succeeded in the Netherlands. It got over a million viewers in the country, and that's why they put the show on. They're able to because the collision shows are what really holds the company together. Those are the big annual shows that they do every year. Uh, what's next for Rico Verhoeven? I, 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 I based on this fight, I don't know, based on this fight, really nothing. But in the heavyweight division, there's still Antonio Plazabot. You could arguably do something like Jamal Ben Sadiq once again. Uh, there is a heavyweight Grand Prix next year, so if he wants to fight a bunch of heavyweights at the same time, that's an opportunity that he has. I would assume that Plazabot is probably one win away from fighting for the title, and he'll make it a really fun fight because he's a very forward pressure kind of fighter. It'll be a much different dynamic than, than this one. Jamal Ben Sadiq, even though Jamal Ben Sadiq is, you know, he lost the overall trilogy. He still makes it a very fun fight against Rico and has moments where he no always knocks him down. He wins rounds against him and he makes it an action packed fight. Uh, what's next for Cookie? He will come back stronger. Uh, I think this is a great moment for him to reassess his career. Just he had an incredible 2023 and defeated a ton of really impressive fighters. And what's next for him? Throw him back in that heavyweight Grand Prix. I think he still has a chip on his shoulder and something to prove. And he didn't have that opportunity in this fight to really show his skills. And I'm sure he's disappointed with himself as well. So this fight had 90 strikes combined, total strikes. Let's compare it to the light heavyweight title fight, which had the same time, same everything else. Uh, they had combined 200 strikes, so double the output. The middleweight bout between Vise and Boapea. Uh, combined was almost 300 strikes, so triple the output. Uh, Hamicha versus Kamara, which was three rounds, so they had less time. Combined was about 150 strikes, so they had them beat there as well. Yeah, it was just a low output fight. And here's the secret. Here's the thing. Here's here's the secret. Heavyweight in most combat sports is is kind of uninteresting. It's it's not the most interesting place in the world. There was a pretty incredible golden era period in early K1 with a lot of incredible heavyweights, and that was an amazing thing to have all those guys fighting at the same time. And you can see over the last 10 years, over the last, yeah, 15 years even, uh, golden age heavyweight eras don't last very long. Shout out Combat Chronicles. Even in professional boxing, which has a very long history, there are very few eras where the there is a golden age of heavyweights it is and when it comes by it's amazing it's incredible look at muhammad ali's era and uh that's pretty much there's a, there's very few other moments like that where that has happened mma had a very very small window where there was a lot of very good heavyweights competing at the same time but for most of its history there was like three good heavyweights you know <laughs> so i don't know maybe on that fight uh, you let me know what you think what's next for rico what did you think of his performance what did you what do you think is next for a cookie to rico sorrow because even thinking about the fight talking about the fight i'm, I'm just and I'll, I'll say one more thing about the heavyweight fight i think if you are combined weight 500 pounds or maybe the uh, that might be 300 kilos if your combined weight is more than 300 kilos or 500 pounds the fight has to end by knockout like you got you got so much weight going on there the main knockout on this card was in the featherweight division at 145 pounds what what you're telling me two guys who combined could their combined weight is 500 pounds couldn't knock each other out come on come on anyway Donegi Abina was able to defeat Muhammad Tushasi for the light heavyweight title. Muhammad Tushasi was a last minute replacement who was going up in weight to challenge for the title. So typically he is a welterweight fighter. Most recently he was a middleweight fighter. And in this fight, he went up in weight uh, to challenge for the light heavyweight title and very clearly struggled with the strength and size of Donegi Abina. And yeah, it was a pretty good fight. Mohamed Tushasi, I think, really raised his stock in this fight because he came in on short notice. He was undersized and he was really landing at a good clip. He still managed to land 88 strikes overall, including most of those were to the head. Uh, but yeah, he, he had a very, he should be very proud of his performance in this bout. Um, he held a good account of himself and despite the loss, he really raised his stock. Donegi Abina here was given a little bit of a, uh, like, a uh, you know, this was a layup. This was a bit of a display fight for him, and I would have liked to see him do a little bit more, but I think 
uh, if you if you, like if you are fighting someone at a lower rate class on short notice, something that you have a size advantage on, you know, you want to really put your stamp on the fight. Um, uh, but but he got the W in the end and really had a great moment with his walkout. That was unforgettable. That's going to be played in every highlight reel. It was really awesome to see him have that walkout moment. What's next for the champion Donegi Abina? Well. I would imagine that he has to fight the interim champ, Tariq Kababes, again. That's the, that would be the third time that this fight has been booked, and that'll be the third time that this fight has been booked. Um, uh, Stefan Latusku was able to get a knockout win in this card, and I would like to see Stefan challenge for the crown first. Uh, apparently that was a title eliminator, but we still have to wait for the interim champion, Tariq Kababes, to challenge, and then the winner will probably fight Stefan Latusku. Uh, so it's figured out for the next little while, of course. Uh, but yeah, Donovan Vise versus Michael Boapea for the middleweight title. Now, this was a great fight. Michael Boapea was constantly putting pressure, constantly landing punches. There wasn't a second in this fight where Michael Boapea wasn't throwing something where he wasn't pressuring something against the champion Donovan Vise. Donovan Vise is a highly skilled fighter, especially when it comes to the counter. So it was amazing to see Michael Boapea come in and just throw down. He was ready. He was prepared. Just through sheer force of will, he was not going to lose this fight, and he just kept throwing down. Donovan Vise is just so sharp and dangerous on the counter that he could protect himself against six shots and then return fire with one. So on every exchange, he was really winning. His punches on the inside were just so much sharper. Eventually, he did win by decision and deserves to do so. But I think all the headlines were won by Michael Boapea. And it's just incredible to see this young man from where he started in glory, where he really didn't have a, really any footwork at some points in his early fights. Uh, he was just walking in and trying to land powerful punches. To see him grow from that into a very skilled fighter over the years, awesome to see. And he's only getting better from here. And I, I, I said, like, you're going to come back stronger? And he said, yeah, I absolutely am. I think this was the first fight that he had where he was doing kickboxing full time. So before this, he was he was working a part time job in addition to kickboxing. But I think this is the first time that he entered about just focused on kickboxing. And, and what a presentation that he and what a performance he put on. This was an awesome fight. I, I just cannot wait to see more Michael Boapea. And of course, Donovan Vise. Of course, he, just an, an incredible, incredible fighter who always shows that he is one step ahead of the entire middleweight division. Donovan Vise has a couple options ahead of him. I'm going to think Ulrik Bokemi, who defeated Sir Ken Oz Kaglain on this card, is likely next. And that was a good fight. That was a very fun fight. Um... I would think that's next for him, but Mohamed Dushasi as well. Mohamed Dushasi is now in that middleweight mix, um, just coming off of the light heavyweight title fight loss. I assume that he is one win away from having a title fight against Don Vise. And the middleweight division is getting a little bit more interesting, but both Ulrich Bokemi and Mohamed Dushasi, I am especially interested in to see those gentlemen against Don Vise. Everyone's favorite welterweight is back. Hamicha, after a long, long time off due to an injury, came back to glory, uh, to the competitive welterweight division. He was the knockout king before, and in this match, his first round was electric, was incredible. What a first round this man had, and then slowly fa faded over time uh, against Diego Kamara. Uh, this was a fun fight. It was a really competitive fight, but yeah, Hamicha got the nod in the end, moves up in the very, very competitive welterweight division. What do you want to see next with Hamicha? Uh, I've seen him, people already say that he is deserving of a title. You, you let me know if that makes sense. Uh, Chico Quasi definitely doesn't think so. Chico Quasi believes he is next in line for the title. Of course, the title has been booked against the gentleman who won House of Glory, uh, and that's coming up in December of this year. Uh, but after that, uh, there's still a lot of great people in the mix. Chico Quasi was able to get his revenge for the one major loss in the last few years in his professional fighting career. Jay Overmere was able to get the decision win against him a few years ago, and Chico Quasi is now able to say that he has avenged that loss with a decision win here at Glory Collision 6. This was a really, really fun fight. Really enjoyed watching it. Both men I'm just so excited for. Uh, I, I'll always tune in for both guys. I am such a fan of both Jay Overmere and Chico Quasi. Uh, but yeah, this was a really fun fight. Um... I mean, if, if I was the matchmaker, I would say Chico Quasi has certainly done enough to get a title shot in that welterweight division, um, and everyone else can just work up. There's a lot of other guys in this division who are just one fight away 
from a title fight. But yeah, good for Chico Quasi. He looked really good in this fight. Really happy to see him get this win and avenge the loss. And uh, these two may still fight five more times in their career. And every single time that they fight, you'll get a different result. You get a more interesting result just because of how dynamic and interesting these guys are. Jay Overmere, that is two losses in a row for him. I mean, the, the, the pre prior loss was a close decision loss against the champion. And now this was a close decision loss against the highly skilled Chico Quasi. So certainly no shame in any of those losses. And with a different set of judges on a different day, Jay Overmere might be two wins up. Uh, it's just the dynamic of this division that week over week you might get different results every single time different set of judges you might get something else happening as i talked about in the light heavyweight division stefan latuski was able to knock out ibrahim el benui uh, he got knocked down and was able to rally back and get a knockout win absolutely awesome to see big fan of stefan latuski really keep your eye on this young man uh and yeah he will continue continue winning and the, making the he, he is making the light heavyweight division extremely exciting abraham vidalis versus ahmed sheik musa uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, this this is the fight that on the stream nobody got to see. So they, they just had the, your event is coming soon. So I have no idea. I don't know. Uh, it looks like Abraham vidali has got a first round knockout. Maybe. Uh, I'll have to trust you on that one. But the featherweight division is kind of coming together here. Uh, Abraham Vidali's with a win. Uh, I'm not sure if he put himself back into the title conversation. He's already lost to Petch once. So I wouldn't mind seeing, uh, let's say someone like David Mejia, who is just coming off a loss to Petch. Um, maybe David Mejia versus Abraham Vidalis, and the winner can rematch Petch. And then Petch can fight someone like Jan Kaffa, who's on a win streak, ranked number two in the division, hasn't yet lost to Petch. It's a, it's a fun weight class. I think every fight in the in the featherweight division here, the 145 pounds, is always the best fight on the card, whether it ends in knockout or a decision. It's always a ton of fun. And speaking of 145 pounds, Jonathan Haggard, he was able to defend Fabricio Andrade for the the for the vacant bantamweight kickboxing world title in one championship. Of course, this fight was about 145 pounds. Um yeah, this was a battle between MMA and Muay Thai for the kickboxing title. And and originally I had picked Fabricio Andrade because he has uh, he has impressive kickboxing experience in the past as well. He looked very good against John Lineker. The thing is, Jonathan Haggerty, he was in the driver's seat for this entire fight. He was in full control of this fight for the entire time. He looked so good in this fight. He was doing stuff. I was so impressed with his active uh, kick game. With his active legs, his legs were always busy doing something, whether it was a knee, whether it was a teep, or whether it was faking. And that's the stuff that sets up the knockout, because the knockout was set up by a fake rear leg step forward. Whether it was going to be a knee or a teep, that's what Adrage was expecting, because Hegarty had set up, had landed so many kicks from that position, from doing that exact thing, and throwing a ton of feints, just using his legs to throw a ton of fakes. He constantly looked like he was two steps ahead of Fabricio Andrade for the entire fight. There wasn't a, a ton of moments that Fabricio Andrade uh, can really say that he won. There wasn't a lot of exchanges where he won. Fabri uh, Jonathan Hegarty was moving backwards and had a very active kick game and a very active feint game just by moving backwards. He was in full control of this fight, and he gets the knockout in round two and is able to say he's a two-sport world champion. Uh, and I will say something about Jonathan Hegarty because a lot of people seem to not like him very much. He's he's a little bit shy and he's a little bit quiet and he's a little bit awkward on the microphone because of that. He's just he's just kind of shy. But I think because of it, he comes off to other people as a little bit smug or a little bit pompous. And he also looks like the guy in school who would bully you. And that part I get. I understand that part. But there is no one who has ever met him or spoken to him directly that said that he's smug or any, and, and even in the, the Muay Thai community, uh, he's not, he's not well loved in that community as well. But I will say that anyone who has spoken to him personally or met him or trained with him or anything like that, or spoken to him off camera, no one ever says that he's, he's a very nice person. He's a very friendly person. And the few private conversations I've had with him that aren't on interviews, he is extremely nice. He's, he's easy to chat with. He's very nice. And he always spent, takes time to, to talk to people and talk to fans. And in, in a very good example of what I'm talking about, it, despite all of his worldly success in Muay Thai and kickboxing, he is quite humble. Uh, so for example, there was a video reel with him and Chael Sonnen a little while ago where Chael Sonnen went to the gym 
and talk to Jonathan Haggerty. And Chael didn't, didn't really seem to know who Haggerty was. And I asked Haggerty about that. I said, Chael, Chael didn't know who you were, did he? And Jonathan Haggerty said, I have not earned that yet. So he's very realistic about like who he is as a person, what his titles kind of mean. Like for our community, his, what he's done is a really big deal. Um, but yeah, he kind of he kind of gets it. But yeah, he's he's an extremely friendly person. Uh, but yeah, no one has anything bad to say about him. Uh, of the people who have actually met him or spent time with him, no one has anything bad to say about him. He's an extremely nice person. So I'm happy to see him get all the success here. And in this fight, he looked incredibly, incredibly sharp. And I would love to say that he's constantly getting better because of his last two fights. He is only 26 years old. He might be entering his physical prime now. And it certainly looks that way based on his last two bouts. But the bout before that doesn't really convince you of that. And that was only in 2022 where he fought Vladimir Kuzmin and just looked a little bit awkward. It looked like he was losing in that fight. But he got the last two wins via knockout. And that's great. Good for him. I'd love to see whatever they're doing next with him, as long as it's not MMA, whether it's kickboxing or Muay Thai, I'm very happy to see that. Um, I really don't care to see him compete in MMA. Like, it just, what? why would I want that? He's so good at striking in Muay Thai and kickboxing. I want to see how good he actually is. I want to see him face someone like Hiroki Akimoto or whoever else is in that division. That would be amazing. And and if you do want to see someone like Jonathan Haggerty compete in MMA, like um, the success that someone like Alex Pereira had is more the exception to the rule. That was one in a million where in the UFC's middleweight division and light heavyweight division, there wasn't a ton of wrestlers and they were quite thin divisions anyway. Those are the weakest divisions in MMA across any organization. So yes, he was able to win a UFC title in like his third or fourth UFC fight in just a few MMA fights. He still hasn't really fought a wrestler in his career, and that's just because of the way those divisions are. Like, could you imagine someone like Jonathan Haggerty at 145 pounds? I don't know. Maybe he could do well. There are other kickboxers in those weight divisions who are doing quite well and doing successfully, um, but I think those are mainly exceptions to the rule but if he chooses to do mma i don't want don't do anything halfway relinquish your titles and go be an, a, a, an mma fighter just like alex Pereira. go do it but if you're holding on to all the titles and taking super fights and taking losses in mma and then you come back and blah 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 i'm just i'm not interested in seeing that if you're going to do mma do it if you're going to do kickboxing and muay thai then do it but doing a little bit of everything i just don't care that much so what's next for him i would like to see him fight hiroki akimoto that would be the fight for me. That would be an awesome fight. I'd love to see it. Hiroki Akimoto is such a good Kyokushin fighter. He is such a successful kickboxer, highly skilled, and he would offer different things than what Fabricio Andrade or Nongo had done to him in the past. It would be a very different fight than anything that he has fought before or in recent memory. Uh, yeah, really looking forward to the future of Jonathan Haggerty and just the way that this man fights, the way he's getting better in between fights. Awesome. Can't, can't wait to see more. But also on this one championship card, there was a little bit of controversy as well as Zhang Paiman got a split decision loss against Rui Botello. So Rui Botello was supposed to be kind of a layup for Zhang Paiman. It's no secret that one championship really likes Zhang and they're trying to get him back into title contention as quickly as possible. There's nothing wrong with promoters. It, 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 the promoters are always going to have certain fighters that they like more than other fighters for various reasons. And they really like Zhang. So they try to give them, you know, easy fights. Um, the thing is with one is that when your stars lose, they don't start promoting two stars. They do rematches until the guy that they like wins. And for example, I've talked about Aliana Rossiana versus Stan Fairtex. You know, this is the girl who submitted Stan Fairtex. That promotes it, right? That That's such a great promotion layup right there. That's a great sentence you can put on the poster, you can put on the trailer. And then eventually the two of them can go through the division and eventually fight for a number one contender or fight for a title, you know, have a trilogy, something like that. But instead they just did a rematch and Aliana Rossiana lost a split decision and she's never been seen since. They haven't booked her in a fight. Why not just promote two fighters? And I think you're going to see this exact thing here with Rui Botello versus Zhang Paiman because Rui Botello uh, won via split decision and already the promoter is saying, let's do a rematch. Why? Why? One of these guys have actually earned a title shot now. Uh, it, this is a very fun and highly skilled division. I would love to see more from both men, especially fighting other people in the division. Why do an instant rematch for something not a title? 
But but let's talk about the fight itself. Let's get let's get into the fight itself. It was a really fun fight, and it showed why kickboxing is the most exciting sport on the planet. This was a back and forth war that showed everything. These two were trading combinations and low kicks and punches. They were brawling at certain points of this fight. Head kicks, they're just slamming into each other with no knockdowns. Absolutely awesome. Would love to see more from both men here. I think by the end, Botello had figured out a few things a little bit better, like Zhang Baiman, uh, like the idea of going first and third, because Zhang was quite often missing, and then uh, Botello was landing more strikes as they were exiting the exchanges. Uh, Botello showed a little bit more experience in this fight. Jane Byman, he's, he's a 20 year old fighter. He's like, he's like a wonder kid. He's, he's just an incredible fighter. Some amazing speed, amazing knockouts. But yeah, but he, yeah, he, his, his lack of experience, oddly enough, his lack of experience sh- sometimes shows in fights. And, but yeah, Rui Botello, uh, I, I mean, the, the judges weren't split on rounds one and two. Those were split rounds for uh, the fighters, you know, Round two for Zhang, round one for Rui. Uh, and then it was the third round that was really split. Two judges gave it to Botello and one judge gave it to Paimon. I mean, having watched the fight, the clinch kind of made it a, a, a tough fight because for almost a minute, these two were doing very little. But then for the other two minutes, it was very high output and high activity. Look, I, I would love to see these two gentlemen do something else. Uh, but yeah, really fun fight, really exciting fight. Hopefully they do more kickboxing in this division and not do an instant rematch because... RWS Muay Thai this weekend. It's booked for November the 11th. This will be the first time in history that two women have headlined Raja Damnan Stadium. This will be Sevgi Venom Muay Thai from Turkey facing off against Nong Prajan Luksai Kongdin. I had talked about this fight before because they fought during the tournament and it was a really close and exciting fight. But in the end, Nong Prajan was able to get the, t- the nod in that fight. And of course, Sevgi now... She was like the, she was the favorite to win the entire tournament, so now she's coming back for revenge in this fight. Uh, both are really fun, really skilled Muay Thai fighters, so I'll be tuning in for this one. It'll be a, it'll be a very fun one. Uh, I've talked about the Luxai Kongdin family before. Uh, some people have asked, like, how many siblings are there? There's nine. They're all fighters. Uh, they have a very interesting story where the father didn't want his kids getting into a life of crime and stuff like that, so he put together a Muay Thai and boxing gym to train them just to keep them busy and off the street. So you're either in school or you're training, you're not doing anything else. And because of it, all of his kids actually ended up being quite notable. Sorry, sorry, I'm just double checking the numbers now. There's 16 kids in total and nine of them are fighters. You would of course know Ida. She is the wife of Rod Tang and a very successful fighter, one of the first women in history to fight at Raja Damnan Stadium. Sankarthit is a boxer and he has some titles in Western style boxing. From the family as well. Duong Wanoi also has some Muay Thai titles. I think at the amateur level, I think it is, or something like that. But yeah, Ida is probably the most famous. There's Nong Persian headlining this weekend. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a family affair for them. And it's great to see. A little fighting family. Uh, also make sure to check out Yaman. He has a fight coming up against Mikuro Asakura. And that's going to be on November 19th. And uh, that's going to be a, a kickboxing bout with four ounce gloves. And it is an event put on by Yaman, uh, Yaman short for Shibuya Man. Uh, he, he's just a star in the in the kickboxing community. Everyone loves his story so much. And he's such a nice guy and always brings exciting, exciting fights. Uh, Makuro Asakura, most MMA fans would know from his time in Ryzen and his brother Kai Asakura and his fight against Floyd Mayweather. Uh, but yeah, they're going to be headlining in a really fun kickboxing battle. I think that's going to be a really good one. That's coming up on November 19th, so make sure to check that out. But this weekend, I think this is mainly RWS and Infusion has some fights on this weekend. But for me, that's it. Folks, that's everything. I don't have anything else to cover off this week. Let me know. I think next week might be a little bit slow. So let me know what I should talk about, what I should take a look at. Uh, if there's something I missed, something to correct, please let me know. Uh, but yeah, folks, uh, this has been a Kick Weekly with me. Huge thank you for your time. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you very much.